Hello, hello, Shagat the Known here. Welcome to another Rust coding stream here on the 12th of December, 2022. Local time, 1811. Um, oh, wait, we already generated the map. I wasn't watching when it happened. Um, last time we did the um, Drunkard's Walk algorithm, which is what we're seeing right here. It's like they're channeling out little sections of the map. And that's what those arrows represent for each step of the algorithm. Pretty cool stuff. And there we got our map there. So I don't think I actually ever did anything here, but yeah, we can see. There we go. There's stuff laying around down here. It's all good, right? It's all cool stuff. So um, that's what we did last time. Today, we're going to be continuing with more map generation goodness. And we're going to be doing the maze and labyrinth generation algorithm slash algorithms. We'll be taking a look at that here in just a moment. So give me one second here. Alrighty. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, my inevitable sneeze. Oh, you started streaming. It's time. Alrighty. A mainstay of dungeon crawl games is the good old-fashioned labyrinth, often featuring a minotaur. Dungeon crawl stone soup has a literal minotaur labyrinth. Tome 4 has sandworm mazes. One knight has an elven hedge maze. These levels can be annoying for the player and should be used sparingly. A lot of players don't really enjoy the tedium of exploring to find an exit. This chapter will show you how to make a labyrinth. <laughs> it's like, hey, people might not like it, but let's do it. It's actually, yeah, it's good to check out. So the initial expectation from me is it's going to be something along the lines of uh, some back backtracking, backtracing algorithm to ensure that we have an actual solution. Um, that's, that's just my guess. I'm not going to go into the details of what that means, but that's my initial guess. We'll see if that plays out. Um, I've never tried generating a maze like this before, but you want to make sure that there is a valid solution. Or, or I guess you could just generate the walls and then, um, pick the furthest possible exit. I don't know, like, we'll see, we'll see how it works, right? I'll we'll probably end up using A-star or something to do pathfinding as well. Just as, as some guesses, again, I don't know, we'll see. But I, I'm thinking in terms of actually generating it, maybe some, like, uh, backtracing... Is it backtracing, backtracking? Okay, it's been a while. Um, whatever, though. So let's go ahead and take a look. So we're going to need the scaffolding. We're going to make maze.rs. And I am going to copy all of this. And then we'll take a look at it and make sure nothing changed. For this, I'm going to stop trying to see, like, what are the new things? Because I think it's basically been set up in such a way that it's um, not a big deal. We'll also copy the random builder stuff in here as well. Um, so let me expand this by one. That feels massive, but it'll be okay. We'll make maze.rs, and we'll plop this in here so we have the maze builder. And then in random builder, I'm going to rewrite over the random builder function here with the new one we've been given. And it's going to complain because we don't actually have maze builder. So we gonna need, we're going to need mod maze. And then we will do, um, let's just have it automatically handle that. And there we are. Okay, good start. Now, easy enough. Actually, let's take a look at what we have in here. Um, we do have some unused things, it looks like. No, we don't. Um... Let's see, they come from common. So, yeah. So the way they did it is they brought these things into super, which is probably a good idea. So in mod, let's do, let's bring in all the stuff from common. And then we'll go ahead and uh, we don't have to do any modifications here now. 
Um, and that, since it is common and these things are going to be used in multiple places, I'm, I'm pretty okay with that. Um, but yeah, I don't know, whatever. Whatever. Um, so let's take a quick look here. We have a map with a starting position, a depth, a history, all that's pretty standard, and noise areas. So I guess we are going to be doing noise um, similar to the last couple of maps. Um, get map, get starting position, snapshot, all that's really easy. Um, this calls a build function for build map. Uh, I always wonder if there's a, a particular reason to do self.build instead of putting the actual logic here in build map. Whatever though. Um, it, it's kind of just like, what's the point of build map if all it does is a one liner to call another function, right? So, um, oh, I think I understand though, because then we can, mm, no, I was gonna say maybe we can make build a little bit more, um, a little bit different for each one, whatever, we might think about that later. I'm gonna make another couple changes here, but uh, we're mostly good to go already. Um, but I see the allow clippy map entry, so we'll address that. Spawn areas, about the same thing. We go through all the noise areas and spawn stuff, and then um, take snapshot. Yeah, nothing special about that. Okay, so then our maze builder, simple, our new function, we just make a maze builder, nothing special about that. And then here, now we're gonna remove this and Clippy's gonna get a little angry at us. Or not, because they're not doing it yet. Okay, they're not actually doing the map stuff yet. Or they had copied it from somewhere else that had it. Um, I hadn't read this yet, so I wasn't sure. So it's pretty much self-documented. Find a starting point, start in the middle, and walk left until we find an open tile. Okay. So literally just get the midpoint, and that's our start index. While the map.tiles start index is not floor. We're, we're modifying, start index is, uh, is mutable. So while it's not floor, we keep going left and we set starting index to the new one. So basically we're looking for the first floor tile is what it sounds like. Well, that's, that's what this says here too but we're trying to read it and understand it from the code. Then we take a snapshot once we find that floor tile. Then we find all the tiles we can reach from the starting point. So we have made this function last time. Remove unreachable areas returning most distant. That gets us our exit tile. And then we set that exit tile to the stairs. And then we, we do the uh, generate Voronoi spawn regions. Um, so that we can actually uh, spawn stuff later. So that's about it. All right, now, actually building a maze. There are lots of good maze building algorithms out there, all guaranteed to give you a perfectly solvable maze. In One Night in the Dungeon, I base my maze building code off a relatively standard implementation, Syusalan's Maze Generator. It's an interesting algorithm because like a lot of maze algorithms, it assumes that walls are part of the tile grid rather than having separate wall entities. That isn't going to work for the type of map we are using, so we generate the grid at half the resolution of the actual map and generate walls based on wall adjacency information in the grid. Let's take a look at this maze generator real quick. Okay, cool. So what it's saying, let's reread that to be clear. It assumes that walls are part of the tile grid rather than having a separate entity like we do. So we're going to generate it half the actual map and we're going to have wall adjacency information. The algorithm started a C++ with pointers everywhere. It took a bit of time to port. The most basic structure in the algorithm, the cell. Cell tile, cells are tiles on the map. Okay, so let's take a look at this. 
Here at the top, I'm going to add a couple things. So what we're going to be doing is using these to essentially define our adjacency that we were talking about. So we're going to make this cell here. And that's why we have a Boolean array here with um, about four, because we have top, right, bottom, and left. And we're going to say true or false to determine what, uh, whether it's got a wall or not. All right, so yeah, we define four constants, top, right, bottom, and left, and assign them to the numbers zero to three. We're going to use these whenever the algorithm wants to refer to a direction. Looking at cell, it's relatively simple. Row and common define where the cell is on the map. Walls is an array with a bool for each of the directions we've defined. Uh, Rust arrays, static, you can't resize them like a vector, are defined with the syntax type, semicolon, number of elements. So that's what we see here, boolean, semicolon, four. Uh, most of the time we just use vectors because we like the dynamic sizing, but in this case the number of elements is known ahead of time, so using the lower overhead type makes sense. Also it's really, really tiny. It's really tiny. We know it's never going to change, um, so those are good reasons to do that. But there are cases where you may not be able to use an array even if you know the size at compile time, depending on how large it is. You might run into some issues. Um, we won't get into that here though. And visited indicates whether we've previously looked at the cell. And the cell also defines some methods. So we'll take a look at those here. First, we're going to have a constructor. Um, so let's do impl cell. So what we're going to start with is we're basically saying the entire map, or well, this is me just thinking ahead a little bit. If our new assumes that we have walls on all four sides, and from the little animation we saw of the algorithm that was mentioned, um, we're and how most of our algorithms have been working, we're going to start with the entire map as walls, and then over time it's going to be hollowed out to build our maze. So that's why we see true, 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 true here. And we're going to update those over time, I would imagine. So yeah, um, and the text says it's a simple constructor. It makes a cell with walls in each direction and not previously visited. Cells also define a function re called remove walls. So it's interesting we're returning a new cell. Oh no, we're ta oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I said returning. Uh, we're we're taking in another cell. So we're comparing two. So my guess here is without having read ahead yet, my guess here is we're going to be getting rid of the boundary between the two cells. Let's find out. I was thinking of some cell cellular automata stuff and for some reason I was like, "Oh, we just did a return. We must be building out the next state." No, we're not. I don't we're not doing that. And we did not do a return. Now I have a little bit of a problem here. 
There we go. So this wall's left. So what we've done here is X is defined as our current column minus our next column. So assuming that we've correctly brought in two adjacent cells, then we'll only have, um, well, assuming we brought in two adjacent cells and they are in different columns, then we will um, basically tear down the wall between them. So in one case, self.wall's left and next.wall's right. So that's saying if next is to the left of our actual cell we're mutating here, then we do that. Or if the next cell is to the right, then our current cell tears down its right wall, our next cell tears down its left wall. I hope that makes sense, because the same thing is about to happen for Y. Now, these conditionals only work for cells that are directly adjacent. You can't have diagonal uh, adjacency or anything like that. You can't have things going across the map. These only work for things that are directly touching um, on one of the faces. So we only have four conditions here. And this is gonna be the same thing except mirrored for, um, for uh, up and down. Oops, I did self again. Glad I'm catching that because that would break the algorithm. And uh, <laughs> I like the text here. Uh-oh, there's some new stuff here. We set X to be our column value minus the column value of the next cell. We do the same with Y, but with row values. If X is equal to one, then the next column must be greater than our column value. In other words, the next cell is to the right of our current location. So we remove the wall to the right. Likewise, if X is minus one, then we must be going left. So we remove the wall to the left. Once again, if y is 1, we're going up, and if y is negative 1, we're going down. So cell is done. Now to actually use it. In our maze algorithm, cell is part of grid. So here's the basic grid definition. So after impl cell, I'm going to do a grid. And it takes a um, generic... Uh, no... It's a lifetime, yeah. It takes a lifetime. Because um, we're bringing in a uh, reference to a random number generator. Okay. I don't think we've really talked all that much about lifetimes, but we've been seeing them a lot in um, systems when we define them. But I mean, the main thing is, is lifetimes are a way to kind of prove to the compiler and say these things have to have a certain lifetime um, because when you're passing references around, when you're doing certain things with references, it freaks out. It says, oh, okay, you gave me a reference to something, but how do I know it's going to live long enough? So you, you can get in some weird cases, um, especially if you start having like vectors of references to things, you can get in some weird places. Um, and then like if you take a reference to that vector of references to things, like it, it you might start running into it. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk much about it here. Actually, we are a little bit. Um, yeah, so it, it's going to explain it as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at the text now. So some commentary on grid. The A... The, the, the um, not comma, uh, single quote uh, apostrophe, A is a lifetime specifier. We have to specify one so that Rust's borrow checker can ensure that the grid will not expire before we delete the random number generator. Because we're passing a mutable reference to the caller's RNG, Rust needs this to ensure that the RNG doesn't go away before we're finished with it. 
This type of bug often affects C, C++ users, so Rust made it really hard to mess up. Unfortunately, the price of making it hard to get wrong is some ugly syntax. Uh, we have a width and height defining the size of the maze. Cells are just a vector of the cell type we defined earlier. Backtrace is used by the algorithm for recursively backtracing to ensure that every cell has been processed. It's a vector of cell indices, the index into the cell's vector. Current is used by the algorithm to tell which cell we're currently working with. RNG is the reason for the ugly lifetime stuff. We want to use the random number generator built in the build function, so we store a reference to it here because obtaining a random number uh, changes the context of the variable. We have to store a mutable reference. The really ugly ampersand apostrophe a mute indicates that it is a reference with the lifetime apostrophe a defined above and is mutable slash changeable. So I want to make a, a personal comment here. We're talking about backtracing, which is related to what I was mentioning earlier. So I was probably on the right track there. Um, that it's not anything special. It's just if you read about this stuff, if you learn about, especially if you take AI courses, um, you may learn about backtracing uh, in, in terms of how some of those problems can be solved. So it's not some special thing. It's just I've been exposed to it before. Um, it seems like, you know, we are going to be going that route. Because well, it makes sense if you're trying to make a solvable maze. Um, we'll probably understand more about backtracing later, though, um, hopefully. So Grid implements quite a few methods. First up, the constructor. Now we're doing a return. Because it's a new, of course. Width and height, cells are going to be a new vec. Backtrace is going to be a new vec. Um, current is going to be zero and RNG is fine as is. Um, curious about something. Might be a better way to do it with an iterator or something, but. Yeah, the double for loop, it's fine. Uh, iterator wouldn't really get around that very well. You still have to push as many things in. I was just wondering if there's a more of a one line or two line, like cleaner way to, to, uh, to do that. There might be, it'd be cool to look into. Um, so there's our constructor and uh, yeah, so we see the lifetime here on the impl block as well as um, grid itself. So the tutorial text does comment on that. Notice that once again, we have we had to use some ugly syntax for the lifetime. The constructor itself is quite simple. It makes a new grid structure with the specified width and height, a new vector of cells, a new empty backtrace vector, and sets current to zero and stores the random number generator reference. Then it iterates the rows and columns of the grid, pushing new cell structures to the cell's vector numbered by their location. So yeah, that's that's part of why it was done the way it was. Rather than just populating with the vec macro and saying, give us X amount of new cells, we need special rows and columns for each one, which is the point of the double loop. That's why I was wondering if there's a nice one-liner or something with iterators. There, there might be but it might be a little awkward. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not gonna think about it more. You could you could zip them up, but then you wouldn't go through the double for loop. You just have pairs of zero. Mm. Yeah, you just have pairs of zero, zero, one, one, and so on, and then you'd stop at a point. I don't know, they're not the same length, so I don't know what happens, whatever. Um, 
So uh, let's see, backtrace sets current to zero, stores a random number generator, and iterates the rows and columns of the grid, pushing new cell structures to the cells vector numbered by their location. Now we also have calculate index in the grid. So this is gonna be kind of similar to what we've been doing with our map, right? We have the map X, Y index thing. Um, this is similar where we're gonna convert rows and columns to, uh, to a, a simple index that we can use to, um, our, our um, backtrace is a vector of U sizes, so those are indices, and those indices will map to cells. I believe that's, that's what was stated. So we need to be able to calculate the index. So we return negative one if we're out of bounds. That's uh, what you might call a sentinel value maybe. Um, you can put some known error value. I don't know if you'd call it sentinel value in this case, but you can basically put some known error value and check against that. So we'll probably see a check against negative one later. And the uh, tutorial actually mentions what I mentioned. This is very similar to our maps x, y index function. It takes a row and column coordinate and returns the array index at which one can find the cell. It also does some bounds checking and returns negative one if the coordinates are invalid. Next, we'll provide get available neighbors. I remember the last time I did this, I was building Conway's Game of Life in a SDL. And I basically built a lot of these same kind of functions um, with like getting available neighbors and uh, calculating indices and stuff. Um, alrighty, so let mute neighbors. It's where you get the current row and column from the current cell. Um, but it's actually... It's the current cell we're working on in the grid, yeah. So we start at zero, but... So we, we start there, and then over time we're going to do this for like every cell. So we're going to get the row and column, and we're just going to do some basic math to get the cells around it. So basically, we have to, we're gonna do current row minus one, current row plus one, and we're gonna do column minus one and plus one. That's basically it. So they order it specifically. We do wanna make sure we keep that order uh, consistent with what they're doing because the code is probably going to rely on that order. So we go to the left of our cell, then we go above it, then we go to the right of our cell, and then we go below it.
All right, so I made a, a slight mistake in here. I got to put a not in front of this, not visited. So if i is not negative one, that's that value we're checking against, like I mentioned, and the cell is not visited, so we use i to index into cells and check if it's visited, then we push this into the neighbors. So we're only processing and only working with cells that we've not currently visited. Um, and then we return neighbors, um, whatever, whatever made it through that conditional and got pushed. So this function provides the available exits from the current cell. It works by obtaining the row and column coordinates of the current cell, and then puts a call to calculate index into an array corresponding to the directions we defined with cell. It finally iterates the array, and if the values are valid, greater than negative one, and we haven't been there before, the visited check, and then it pushes them into the neighbors list, it then returns neighbors. A call to this for any cell addresses, for any cell address will return a vector visiting, oh my goodness, a call to this for any cell address will return a vector listing all of the adjacent cells to which we can travel, ignoring walls. We first use this in find next cell. Right, so fn find next cell. So we're just gonna say get us available neighbors if neighbors is not empty um i wonder if clippy's gonna like that isn't there a nice no um for some reason i thought there was another check we could do but if it's not empty then um neighbors.len is one We return the only thing that's there. Else, return some neighbors, and then we do self dot rng dot roll dice. All right, that should do it. Otherwise, none. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, we're returning an option to say there might not be another cell, right? So if the list is not empty, I almost feel like it should be another way around. I almost feel like we should say, if it is empty, return none. And then we don't need an else clause. We can just do all this in the main body here. So we're going multiple, like there's this like paradigm of code where people hate nesting. So we could say if neighbors is empty, none. Uh, oops, return none. And then we could do these basic checks down here. Um, Oh yeah, and because we're now down here and it's just flowing out, get rid of the returns. So same thing, I don't know which one is better or not, but um, same thing, right? So basically, if it's empty, we return none because there were no neighbors. If there's only one, if the length is one, then we just return that one, otherwise we do a roll to neighbors.len and we subtract one from it because it goes, if there are four neighbors, which would be the max, then um, we'd roll one through four, but we have to index with zero through three. So that's what the minus one is for. Simple enough. And there we have find next cell. I say paradigm though, it's more of like a school of thought. Nesting is bad. And uh, you can see a lot of nesting sometimes in Rust, but I do think it's nice to try and back off of some of that. We got a new, constru uh, new construct recently 
which is the um, not if it's it's similar to if let uh, let else. Yeah, I think let else. Um, and that allows us to remove some because if let requires you to then go into a nested block, but let else doesn't because you can basically do your error handling, bounce out of the function or whatever in the else block of the let. And then after that else block, whatever was contained in the, the option or the result, you have access to. So it's really nice. Um, okay, so we have uh, find next cell. And the function is interesting in that it returns an option. It's possible that there's nowhere to go from the current cell, in which case it returns none. Otherwise, it returns sum with the array index of the next destination. Works by obtaining a list of the neighbors from, for the current cell. If there are neighbors, if there's only one, then return it. Otherwise, pick a random one and return it. If there are no neighbors, return none. We'll use it to, uh, we'll use this from generate maze. So we got a new one here. We got some fancy comments. I'm gonna copy those because I don't like typing stuff like that. All right, so fn generate maze. We actually pass a maze builder in. Okay. So we're gonna generate. We're gonna make our maze builder, and then in the build function, we're gonna pass it to generate maze. I bet. So we're gonna make a regular all loop here. And we're gonna find next cell, and then we're gonna match on that. Set it visited to true. And then push this cell into the backtrace. Now for the fun part. Let's take a look at how this works. I cannot type. Split it mute is a fun one. We have, I don't think we've seen that show up yet in the uh, in this tutorial. It allows us to get two mutable references to the same thing, to the same like vector or whatever. Um, so that's what we're doing here. At the the midpoint, which we're uh, which we're specifying, which is going to be whichever one of these is larger either the current or the next cell, we then get two references to them from here. So these slices both come from the same vector cells, but we're allowed to mutate both of them independently. Split it mute has essentially proven that we're not gonna be stepping on each other's toes. So it, it lets us get around some of the um, potent uh, issue is a, a, a strong term but some of the issues with the um, borrow checker. It's a bit of a strong term. The borrow checker is a good thing. And we're using this min here. So basically we need to programmatically figure out um, what the index is to get the cell that we're actually looking at. Um, so split it mute works around that midpoint. So the first list is everything to the midpoint, but not excluding the midpoint. And the second one includes the midpoint. So for the second one, we can just do for cell two, um, and mute higher part. I did misspell it still. As I said, I couldn't spell. We're gonna do higher part zero. I was like, why does that look so wrong? What is going on? Um, I was thinking height, and it turned into heighter, and it got all weird. Okay.
So we're gonna use cell two to remove the walls from cell one, and they're actually both gonna be modified. Don't forget, it modifies self and it modifies the reference that gets passed into it. Okay, and then we use the next cell. And we also have a none case here. Backtrace is empty. Self.current is self.backtrace. Oh, if it's not empty, yeah, my bad. I typed the not, but I didn't read it correctly. So if backtrace is not empty, then current becomes the first thing in the backtrace. And then we remove it. Else break. So what's going to happen is, um, we're, I'm sure we're going to get an explanation of it. Um, let me just do these last couple of lines here, and then I'll I'll get into it, I guess. Um, let's follow this. So that's our break. We have one of those, and we have one of those. And self dot copy to map. All right, copy to map we don't have yet, um, so we're going to have to define that in a minute. Um, it's goofy. They, he shows an example of the um, of the algorithm working before showing the copy to map. Um, okay, so what's going to happen here is... Yeah, so what's going to happen here is um, our our basis case that's going to break us out. Let's go ahead and, and, and you know, look at this and understand this algorithm a little bit. Um, the thing that's going to break us out of here is if backtrace is empty. So um, if backtrace is not empty, then we'll do some stuff here. But the only way we're ever going to get out of this loop is when there are no neighbors and there's nothing in the backtrace. So the backtrace is really important. Um, and this is kind of what I've been alluding to a little bit. So let's also think about how that's gonna be used here. So let, let's look at the algorithm. We start up at, uh, I mean, we know it's not gonna be a completely infinite loop, but it's just a loop. So unless we give it away to break, then it's never going to break. Uh, so we start up a loop and we take our current cell and we set it to visited. And then we find our next cell. Now, assuming there is a next, that's what this match is doing, right? So match next, and then sum. We get the U size, the index, out of the sum. And then we also set the next cell to visited. And we put our current cell in the backtrace. So that's important for later, right? So we put whatever cell we're on in the backtrace. So basically every cell that this loop directly processes is going to go into the backtrace. Then we split the cells in half, or not in half, but in two, split it mute. That way we can get access to cell one and cell two. Um, so this is what I, you know, I kind of already talked about it. But index zero of the higher part, um, is it called higher or higher part? In the, I mean, it doesn't really matter. The code is fine. There. Um, index zero of the higher part is the 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 next cell that or the the yeah, it's it's like the next cell that we're. Um, oh no, it's not. My bad. You know it is. My bad. Yeah, it is. Okay. Sorry, I had to look down here. I was getting confused a little bit. It is. So the trick is, though, we're using this standard compare max because we need to make sure that we split in the correct order. So that's the real trick here. So whichever one is larger um, is where we're going to do the split. So then in the first one here, 
we need to just find the index based on whichever one is smaller because that's not how we did the split. And then on the second one, since we know where we did the split, um, it'll be the first thing here. So we have cell one and then cell two is our next, is our new next cell basically. Now we've got them split apart. They can both be mutated separately despite the fact that they're in the same overall collection. And then we do remove walls, which we already talked about earlier, but basically if the cells are um, next to each other on the, like if they're on the same row, if they're next to each other going left and right, then you'll remove the left and right walls that they share. If they're up and down, you'll remove the up or down walls that they share with each other. Just trying to say it as simply as possible. And then um, now we set self.current to next. So then we're gonna repeat this loop, right? We're gonna be done with that match. We're, well, we're gonna copy the map and we're gonna do the generator snapshot. Not really that fancy. Um, but uh, after that, we're gonna go back through. And now we've updated current to be that next cell that we just used. So we'll look for the next cell's neighbors and then we'll basically do the same thing from there. Um, and remember, find next cell gives us some random cell, right? Assuming there's more than one neighbor, it's gonna give us random cell. So we might go up, we might go down, we might go left. We can go all kinds of different directions. I mean, four, but we can take whatever random direction we want. So that's gonna give us a lot of variation in our maze. But what happens if there are no neighbors? For instance, we go to uh, get the next cell or whatever, and well, we can't, because what if there are no neighbors, right? If neighbors is empty, we return none. That's where we fall down to the backtrace. And remember, what we've been doing is every time we process a cell, we add it to the backtrace. So then as long as there's something in the backtrace, we'll then take that thing out of the, um, is it? Okay, it is doing it that way, yeah. So we'll then take the first thing and backtrace, and that'll be our new current. So if the first time we process the cell, it had four neighbors, now we might look at it again and it has three neighbors or two neighbors or something. So we can then take a different neighbor and take a different route out of a cell we've already processed. And that's the idea of backtracing right? And that's what's going to make sure that we actually fill out the entire map. Okay. Copy to map, I think is going to be pretty straightforward um, in, in terms of what we're doing. Uh, we are going to be taking that current cell that we just worked with and uh, copying the data copying that data relevant to it like, okay, I, I guess the yeah, I guess the walls and everything. We're going to have to de define the walls and everything in our map, walls and floor tiles. So it's probably going to be fairly straightforward, but we'll just have to do a couple checks there. So we haven't done it yet, but I, I think it kind of makes sense what we're doing, right? We've generated the idea of like our cell and how many walls it has and everything. We just need to get that data into our actual map in a usable form for the game now. So we're going to take a look here at the um, at the page, and there's a bunch to read. So let's start going through it. I'm going to not scroll down anymore because it's going to spoil the the visuals of it. So now we're onto the actual algorithm. Let's step through it to understand how it works. We start with a loop. We haven't used one of these before. You can read about them here. Basically, a loop runs forever until it has a break statement. We set the value of visited in the current cell to true. We add the current cell to the beginning of the backtrace list. We call find next cell and set its index in the variable next. If this is our first run, we'll get a random direction from the starting cell. Otherwise, we get an exit from the current cell we're visiting. If next has a value, then split cells to two mutable references. We will need two mutable references to the same slice. Rust normally doesn't allow this, but we can split our slice to two non-overlapping parts. This is a common use case, and Rust provides a safe function to do exactly that. And that would be the split at mute. 
get mutable reference to cell to the cell with the lower index from the first part and to the second from start of second part. Okay, that's that's confusing, so let me reread that. Get a mutable reference to the cell with the lower index from the first part, and the second cell reference we're gonna get is the start of the second part. Adding some extra words there maybe makes it a little more clear. Um, we call remove walls on the cell one cell, referencing the cell two cell. If next does not, so back to the match, if next did not have a value, it's equal to none, then, then we check the backtrace. If it's not empty, we set current to the first value in the backtrace list. If it is empty, we finish, so we break out of the loop. Finally, we call copy to map, which copies the maze to the map, more on that below, and take a snapshot for the iterative map generation renderer. So why does this work? Well, the first few iterations will get a non-visited neighbor, carving a clear path through the maze. Each step along the way, the cell we visited is added to the backtrace. It's effectively a drunken walk through the maze, but ensuring that we cannot return to a cell. When we hit a point at which we have no neighbors, we've hit the end of the maze, the algorithm will change current to the first entry in our backtrace list. It'll then randomly walk from there, filling in more cells. If that point can't go anywhere, it works back up the backtrace list. This repeats until every cell has been visited, meaning that backtrace and neighbors are both empty. We're done. The best way to understand it is to watch it in action, which we'll do in a minute. But before we do that, we have the copy to map function. So we'll just plop right down here under generate maze. We'll take immutable reference to the map. Clear the map for i in map.tiles.iter mute. Okay, why is it mad? Hang on. Because I put an L randomly. Oh, we're not, um, there we go. Oh, that's where the L came from. I missed, I was like, what? Okay, map.tiles.iter mute. We'll set them all to walls. That's our way of clearing. So this one's going to be interesting. We mentioned this earlier, but the map is half resolution because we're not factoring in the walls. Um, so this is why we're seeing times two happening on this index. Now that's probably still a little confusing. I'll have to maybe check a couple things like our new grid. We haven't made one yet with the width and height, but I think that's where we're going to see it come into play, where we do the half resolution. Um, okay, so we'll set that to a floor, and then if not, cell.walls top. So, yeah, if there's no wall in the top, then we set the top to floor. And we're going to repeat this for the other four. At risk of making an error, I'm going to copy these. I kind of don't like this. I always like to go up, down, left, and right in that order. Um... So for right, it's going to be map.tiles 
index plus one. And that's going to be a floor. So left, you might be able to guess what it's going to be. And in this should be plus index plus map width is U size. That just scoots us down to the next row and we should be good to go. So this is where the mismatch between grid cell and our map formats resolved. Each cell in the maze structure can have walls in any of the four major directions. Our map doesn't work that way. Walls aren't part of a tile, they are a tile. So we double the size of the grid and write carved floors where walls aren't present. Let's walk through the function. We set all cells in the map to be a solid wall. For each cell in the grid, we calculate X as the cell's column value plus one and Y as the cell's row value plus one. I don't 100% understand the plus ones on those right now. Yeah, I, 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 I'd have to think about that. Oh no, I think I do know. It's it, it, That's also part of the half resolution thing, I believe. Yeah, we, we might have to do some thought experiment on it later, but I believe that's also due to the half resolution. Basically, um, because we're at half resolution, something in that mode that's at, at, at one one now actually needs to be at two two or something, right? I mean, simple way of, of looking at it um okay so then three set index to map x y index of double the x and y values so spread each cell out then we set the map tile at index to be a floor if the cell we're referencing does not have a top we set the map tile above our index to be a floor and we repeat for the other directions so we're going to be wasting a lot of time by snapshotting at every iteration we're building a huge list of snapshot maps. It was great for learning the algorithm. It simply takes too long when playing the game. We'll modify or generate maze function to count iterations and only log every tenth. We'll do that in a minute. I think we can actually witness this in action now. So let's try to take a look at it. I think we, have we satisfied everything? I don't think anything's screaming at me. So it'll take a while to play, but we'll get to see it in action. No, something is mad. Oh, nothing's being used. Of course. Nothing's really being used yet. Where did we um, run into the issue? Yeah, so we didn't actually generate it. Um, so here it's going to be... Uh, how do we do this? Did I miss a bit somewhere? Or do I just have to figure it out? I'll do either one, but I want to make sure I didn't miss it somewhere. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, so we're going to have to figure it out. That's okay, it'll be fun. Um, we're almost done, though. So, what we need to do is build that grid and use it. So, I think it's just going to be grid new. So, where's our build here? And it's going to be self.map.width over two, self.map.height over two. I hate the no spacing on it. I'm going to fix that. And mute RNG. Grid.generate maze. Self. Can I borrow grid as what? Oh, grid, yeah. 
I think that might do it. No, what's mad now? 169 and 13. So map X, Y index. I want to know what values it had. Length is 3440, but the index is 3440. So it's an off by one, um, but let's take a look. Let me make sure I didn't make a slight mistake on that real quick. Where's it at? Yeah, so that's fine. So it's just it's just an off by one. Well, I think it is. It's going to be related to how we made that grid. Let me double check one more thing. Yeah, there is no new grid being made in the text here, so I could pull up the source. Or just work with it. I'm wondering if... Do we need a plus one on these? That's what I've been trying to think about. Or will that look funky? I know I don't need the parentheses, but I like them. No, I'm still hitting hit the same thing. I think I I think it's actually maybe minus one there. I'm not just throwing things randomly, but I was thinking, wait a minute, plus one's not gonna help because it's gonna give the grid more room. We actually wanted to take room away. Yeah. So I made a mistake when I said plus one. All right, so this is way too much as we were told, but we can actually see it do the backtrace. So it's gonna come up to a point, there's a dead end, and then it goes back up to the top. And then every once in a while, it's like, ooh, it keeps hitting a spot where it can't work. Now we're back up near the top though. So that's backtracing. Now it would be cool to see another approach here. Um, and it was mentioned that this is really slow, right? Like this is, really really slow because every single step it's it's um saving it's saving the status of the map and that's a little bit much to watch right so i, I like right here we have two um we have two that are going to be visited at some point they're very very simple very basic not much can happen there they there's only like one unvisited neighbor for either one I mean, it's going to be a pretty easy way that it gets resolved, but it's cool stuff. Um, I think we've seen enough to see how it works. Now, there's another way that you could do backtracing. I don't think it would build a good maze, but before we do any more changes here, while we have this really slow, fine-grained view of it, um, imagine. let's imagine if instead of that, we did self.backtrace.len minus one. Um... So what if we kind of went from the end of it? Oh, whoops, that's really not gonna work, hang on. We also need to make sure we remove that same index as well.
that's going to lead us into a bad situation. So let's take a look at just how it might be different if we went from the back instead, because that's going to be the most recent cell that we added. Um, so it's going to give us quite a bit of a different result. Um, I think it'll be cool to check out. So we're getting close to the first backtrace. Now see, it started back from a pretty recent place that we visited. So I think what this is going to end up doing is generating really long paths early on. Um, it's actually going to really prioritize that, I believe. Um, we can leave this as is. So it's still producing a maze, right? This little square up here, it's going to get filled in like at the, at like one of the, no, it might take a little bit. Yeah, depends on how these next backtraces happen. You see how we're, we're doing? We're, we're like prioritizing these really long paths because we're still working from the nearest backtrace. So I think we're going to see these much different results here. But again, it's still giving us a maze. And it's cool to kind of see how that approach can change things. So then the next thing... Now that we've seen it in action, I'm going to leave that as is for now. We can easily change those to zeros. We're going to speed up the generator. So in generate maze, um, we're going to keep track of like iterations, basically. So it says we're wasting a lot of time by snapshotting at every iteration. Building a huge list of snapshot maps is great for learning the algorithm, but simply takes too long when playing the game. We'll modify our generate maze function to count iterations and only log every tenth. So, um, see, right after the match. That's not 10, that's 50. Self.copy to map. You know, we'll just grab this. Uh, the tutorial text does say 10, but the code has 50. I'm going to put 10. I want a little bit more fine grain detail. Alrighty. And that brings it up to a reasonable speed, and we can still watch the maze develop. So let's take a look at it now, again, with our modified backtrace. So see, I, I told you, it's going to prioritize these really long, interesting paths. And there we have it. Um, so we purged, if you didn't notice there, it was very quick, but we purged things that could not be reached. Um, there is no exit yet though. We're gonna do that in a moment. Now let's take a look at this with zeros. And I think we're gonna see much shorter paths happening per, per chunk, because we're gonna go all the way back to the start of the backtrace. And what that's gonna mean is wherever we kind of hit that end of the cycle, it's now going to go back to an earlier position and you may end up blocking some more of those paths, but I think this will make a bit of a more intricate dungeon when we do it this way. Or a uh, maze, not dungeon, eh, whatever you want to call it. See, we're not like, right, that one went pretty long, but it got over there and now we're like back to the starting areas. 
So we're not quite prioritizing those really long paths like we were seeing before. And there we go. We had a purge there, but we are good. All righty. Um, well, with that, we're almost done here. The next thing we're going to do is um, find an exit. Fortunately, our current algorithm will start you at cell 1, 1, which corresponds to map location 2, 2. So in build, we can easily specify a starting point. Um, okay, where's build? So we have this here, but we want to do something different. I think we're going to get rid of this is what we're doing. Or we're just going to guarantee we start at two. Let's start index equal. Okay, yeah, we'll get rid of this. Sure. We're not doing the other thing anymore. And then we do the exit tile. We already are placing the stairs though, never mind. Everything else is already there. And it's also a great test of the library's Dijkstra map code. It can solve a maze very quickly. Once again, we restore the random builder. I'm not gonna do that right now. We're going to test this. We're going to try and navigate through one of these or something. I'm a little confused by what we did there. We just always start in the same spot. That's a little odd to me. OK, actually, we are going to change this to 50 now. I understand why it was there, but I wanted to see the fine grain building early on. And that's pretty much it though. We got us a map. Wait a minute. It was all the way down the bottom right, huh? Begin new game. So we want we can now like uh scour like just search through here, see what we find. Yeah, we gotta solve it. We'll commit to solving one. Cause we're basically at the end of the session. It's been just a little over an hour. This one wasn't bad. Pretty easy to understand algorithm if you understand backtracing. Okay.
We are hungry. Just gonna use a potion. If I wait, then I lose um I lose hunger. And it's gonna take a while to solve this thing. What I should do, I should just start following the left wall. We already saw, if you paid attention, the stairs were at the, um... They're at the bottom right, which is to be expected. This is a matter of getting down there. Did I get more rations yet? I did. I should have waited a little bit longer, huh? Oh no! Found ourselves in a dead end. Checking that for food. Might starve to death in here. This would work better if it came up in the middle of a run where you already had a bunch of stuff. I actually really like the hunger system, but I also don't. I feel like it, it's too fast. I'm thinking of like a dwarf fortress or cataclysm or something. This is like a rapid fire hunger system. Like, are right, you hungry again? Let's go. There we are. I'm intentionally waiting a bit until we get a little bit hungrier. All right, we're pretty close to the stairs, but it's a matter of getting to them, right? Pretty cool. I'm happy with it. Now here's the thing. It, we were close, but that's not going to get us to him. So my next guess is to actually go up and over and to the right. Around that area we were just in. It's cool to see the spawns working in here, though. Damn it. Wanted food. We might die. No. And there's no, like, logical place to say there might be food here, there might be food there. It's probably because the noise areas don't play well with the walls here. There's so many walls that the noise areas don't have a lot of options. So you lose a lot of, uh... Oh, there we go. 
you lose a lot of fidelity, I would imagine. Or not fidelity, but like you lose a lot of the spawns. Like, oh, we can't spawn there, it's a wall. So as, as they said, like, players can find this tedious and look how long it's taken. That was, uh, that's my cursor, that purple thing. We're going to end up going through most of this to get to the end. This is what I was trying to say earlier, go down this way. I had a trap. Very glad it didn't kill me. All right, this did it. It's got to be over here. There's no other way to get here. Wait a minute. Oh no, that's that's them. Yeah. Hey, we did it. And look how quick the next ma the maze is already generated. Like it's very fast to generate. It's just watching it that makes it seem slow. All right, cool. That's it for the session, really. I don't think there's anything else we care to do. Um, the code mentions to make the random builder a little more random again. I don't really think we need to do that. It's not special. Next time, we're going to unrandomize it as we do another map anyway, so it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, in this chapter, you built, we built a maze. It's guaranteed solvable maze, so there's no risk of a level that you can't beat. You still have to use this type of map with caution. They make good one-off maps and can really annoy players. Um, yeah, I was thinking what you'd want to do is something like our spawn table where you have weighted spawns. If you're just doing random levels, you have weighted, weighted um, choices for which map builder you use and make the maze less random. Or, uh, well, make the maze less common, I mean. That would be my initial approach there so that's going to be it for the session or for the the coding and stuff today good old hour and 22 23 minutes not bad next we're going to take a sneak peek we will see the animation here but i won't do it next time i don't like to spoil them diffusion limited algorithm it says um so this looks pretty cool kind of spreading out It's actually using Drunkard's Walk, apparently. Oh, it's a second variant of the algorithm. Okay. Interesting. I like the look of it. It's like growing. Feels very organic. Symmetry. Oh, this is cool. Brush sizes. Yeah, it's it's carving out multiple tiles at once now. Cool. All righty. Well, that's next time. Let's take a, lo a look at the table of contents. So we're going to do that. And then adding symmetry and brushes to the library. So I might try to do both of those next time. Since this is a... Um, this is going to be a big refactor, so I'll try to do both. And then after that, it'll be Voronoi Hive Maps, which I'm really excited about because they look cool. All right, let's get back to what's next. Diffusion Limited is next. We're not doing that today, of course. So. Thank you to anyone who showed up, whether you're lurking or chatting or whatever. I really appreciate it. 
Um, if you like these coding streams and stuff, then uh, you can hit that follow button. I do these maybe a couple times a week. Don't always make it, but it's usually Monday, Wednesday. Um, so hop on in here. It's a good time. Um, these are getting... I, I, I really like where this is going. I've been really excited about these map generation ones. Um, also, you could drop a follow, or not follow, but you could do all the, the fun YouTube stuff. Or if you're watching it in YouTube, I'd appreciate if you do all that stuff. The like, subscribe, notification bell, comment, you know how it all works. Um, yeah, I missed a little bit there for a couple of weeks, but I'm getting back in the swing of things now. So we should probably hit these other ones up on Wednesday as expected. Um, the Diffusion Limited and then the Refactor. So it should be good stuff. And uh, I think we're you know, making decent progress through these. I've backed down a little bit on the size of these where I'm not trying to go for like three hours or whatever. I feel like it's quite a bit to do at once. And I, I am trying to absorb the material here because I think we'd be looking at, for diffusion. We'd probably be looking at another hour and a half or, or more. And I'd rather not try to cram that in today. So I think it's, it's good to get a little balance, right? So again, appreciate anyone watching. And uh, I don't think I have anything else to say. So until next time, have a good day, have a good night, whatever it is, wherever you're at, take it easy. Raiden, what's your status? Colonel? I've got Emma Emmerich here. We've managed to avoid drowning. Good job.